Awesome. So once again, I am Lakeisha Page, the director of the Tennessee Stars College Savings 529 program. Thank you for joining us for our second session of Tennessee Stars Academy. It is my pleasure to welcome our special guest, Mr. John Hupello, who is a nationally recognized expert in education loan finance and college planning. John worked on Wall Street and served as a senior executive vice president and chief financial officer of First Marblehead Corporation. Additionally, he is the founder of Invite Education, an online platform that provides calculators, search engines, and content to empower families to make more informed college decisions. Also, he is the co-author of Plan and Finance Your Family's College Dreams. His website, mycollegecorner.com, offers free articles, webinars, calculators, and search engines for financial aid, scholarships, and colleges. In addition to his esteemed business accomplishments and college planning acumen, John is a dad. He has been, he has been in your shoes and he has navigated the college savings and college completion journey for his two children who are employed college graduates. So I know you will learn a lot today. So please help me welcome Mr. John Hupello. Well, Lakeisha, yeah. thank you so much for that introduction. And also, I uh, just wanna say uh, thank you uh, to your colleagues at Tennessee Stars and in the treasurer's office for making this possible today particularly in these uh, times that have been such under such stress uh, to take time out of the day and to emphasize this idea of saving for college is just really remarkable. So I want to thank you and, and abs absolutely thank you for this great opportunity um, to discuss this topic today. Um, you said employed, uh, not just the proud dad of my two college graduates, but I, I put that employed in parentheses there because it focuses me for these presentations on a word that you said uh, that is absolutely critical, and that's completion. Um, the goal uh, sometimes we think is to have our children get into college, uh, but we quickly realize that in order to have that investment work out and make sense for the family and all the blood, sweat, and tears that we put into getting the child into college and having saved during all that time, uh, it's the back part, the job and the career that's most important. And for that reason, I'd, I'd like to have that little reminder to myself. And it's not just about graduating from a four-year college. It's not what's required for success. What's required for success is the opportunity to, to leverage and take advantage of whatever higher education opportunity might be available. It might be a community college or a Senate apprenticeship program or a four-year private school or a public school, whatever it might be. But I wanted to start there because whenever we talk about the process of planning, paying, trying to get into a college, it quickly becomes extremely emotional because it's a family's, uh, it's, the, it's like I said before, blood, sweat, and tears. It, it's what it, they defines themselves sometimes. So I'd like to just take a step back every once in a while. If you put up the next slide, please. Um, I'd like to just talk about savings in the context of how to pay for college and the important role that it plays, but it's not the only role. I, I sometimes uh, think that families uh, get bundled up in the emotion of thinking they have to save all, or they're gonna borrow the whole thing, or they're gonna win the financial aid lottery. What I hope to be able to say today is that savings can play a really critical, uh, uh, it's gonna play a critical role in the family's planning package. And when you go up on the Tennessee Stars website, there's a discussion there about planning to save and planning for college. And, that's what we want to accomplish today. We'll talk a little bit of how to pay for college. Uh, we'll also then talk a little bit about the options to save for college. And then we'll uh, put that in context around the next point, uh, which is the nuts and bolts of 529 plans themselves and, and why they've become so popular, what the advantages are of those 529 plans. Uh, and then finally, um, as we talked about, uh, last point will be around crowdfunding. And this opportunity, crowdfunding, by the way, is like the 2021 version of help from aunts, uncles, parents, and others, right? So crowdfunding is kind of a cool term, uh, but the reality is uh, 529 programs have been trying to foster this kind of encouragement um, all through the process. Um, so I hope everyone will um, 
be able to relax a little bit, um, not be anxious about this topic of saving for college, because no matter what you're doing, just by being here today, um, it's a step absolutely in the right direction. And, and we know that your uh, your students, your loved ones will will be beneficiaries of all this good work. Um, so let's let's go to the next slide. And again, I want to put in the context of savings as a way to pay for college. And Lakeisha, if you could put up all of them, there are about four four more points here. When we talk to families holistically about how to pay for college, these are the primary places that families can turn. And we put family savings and income at the top. We're going to talk more about how to save. But the other point is that once a student goes off to college, uh, many times families find that they have a little more money in their wallets at the end of the month because that student, particularly, I had girls, but uh, my friends who had boys tell me boys eat a lot. And they use a lot of gas and cars and all the rest of it. So a lot of us have found that we have a little bit more disposable income at the end. And I, I think that's important because there you can use that income to either continue to save or maybe um, use some other opportunities to reduce the amount of loans that might be necessary. The second part uh, that we'll talk about, and we'll focus on this a little bit in the next few minutes, is around finding scholarships and other free money. And the reason, obviously, that's important is that that's a way to leverage all that great savings. The other point uh, that I would make around payment plans on the right side goes to the earlier, very early comment about income. So what might happen is if your student goes off to college and you may have been saving 50 or $100 a month or whatever it might be, you could continue to use that allocation, that 50 or $100 a month, and use one of these payment plans that a school might offer rather than taking more in loans. Um, so we can we can talk about that if there are questions, but I think we really want to get on to the point of how do you minimize student loans and parent loans? And the way to do that, of course, is through the combination of those top three boxes, savings, scholarships, and payment plans. One of the sayings that I, I like is that um, student loans should be the last resort, the last resort, not the first option to pay for college. When we hear about this $1.7 trillion of student loan debt crisis, I really think that a lot of that could be controlled by students making good choices about what school is affordable for them, and then also realizing that the student loan really should not, again, be the first thought of how to pay for college. It really should be at the end as the filler. So that, that's the context about how savings fits into the many options to pay for college. And again, a family should not think that it's going to be one of these buckets that will make the will be the answer for them. But really, it's little pieces of each one. So if you have some savings, some scholarship money, maybe use a payment plan, use the financial aid that you're going to get from a school, um, and then rely on loans toward the end as the gap filler. Um, that could be a really successful plan for your family. The next slide, uh, let's talk a little bit more about other options, and I say be careful with these because the media sometimes likes to uh, talk about using retirement savings. On the other one, uh, the next box is credit cards. And so the two comments here are, are these. One, retirement savings and, and that nest egg for us parents as we get on and, and want to retire, it's a really tough time if you're in your late 40s or 50s to start taking a lot of money out of your retirement plan to give your child a little bit more of a way of uh, opportunity at college. Because again, you can't borrow for your retirement. So that becomes a really difficult um, option. So we're not real fond of that. I think retirement savings should be for retirement. College savings should be for college. The other uh, point that people make at seminars when I do this, so somebody will raise their hand inevitably and say, well, what about credit cards? You know, I like my frequent flyer miles or my cash back or whatever it might be. And my point uh, there is the same every time, and that is that might work really nicely for you as long as, and this is the caveat, as long as you're paying that balance in full that next month. Otherwise, it becomes an extraordinarily expensive way to pay for college if you're paying 15 or 20 or 23 percent interest on your credit card borrowing. So, again, uh, I think it's an option for some folks, uh, but for a uh, sort of baseline way to think about paying for college, um, I would stay away from retirement savings and I wouldn't rely on my credit cards. Um, so that's uh, sort of out of the way. Now we get to the fun stuff, uh, which is uh, how do we how do we leverage again our savings 
And the way to do that is finding the no strings attached, what we call free money. And there are many different ways to find free money. Um, one old fashioned way is to go on Amazon and, and put in scholarships 2021 and, and see what books are available. There are actually some really good scholarship books available uh, that are updated. Another way to do it, of course, is to um, find free money via college search engines. Um, and uh, Lakeisha, if you click one more time, we have mycollegecorner.com. This is a free resource uh, that my company offers. There are, we'll see at the end, there are search engines there, a college search, an EFC calculator, which is financial aid, and the scholarship search. So you can put in uh, parameters and, and find some free money there. I would want to make uh, another point about the free money, and that is um, looking within the state is often a really great opportunity. On the Tennessee Stars website, for instance, uh, there's a discussion there about the Tennessee Stars 529 College Savings Program Awards. I actually looked this morning, and it was a great picture of a 10-year-old holding a check for $5,000 that was going to go into her Tennessee Stars 529 account. Uh, so not only did she win some money, she got a, a great picture with the state treasurer, and you know how cool is that for a 10-year-old? So um, look internally, talk to high school uh, school counselors. Uh, they're great sources of information about uh, some of these uh, free money opportunities. Also within Tennessee, um, there's a terrific program called Tennessee Promise, which uh, many of you may know about. Um, this program is what's known in sort of parens as a last dollar program. Um, that means that uh, Tennessee Promise will provide whatever amount remains after a student gets a Pell Grant or a HOPE scholarship or a Tennessee Student Assistance Award grant. So it's a last dollar funding. And the other important point here, and, and this is extremely important, is that the promise of scholarships and, and awards are for tuition fees only and at community colleges and associate degree granting programs at some of the four-year schools. I'm also, you can use the money for trade uh, certificates. But back to my first point uh, that I wanted to make, um, trying to find the right educational solution for a student doesn't necessarily mean that they need to go to a four-year program, and there's money available in Tennessee to help all students with all different kinds of academic uh, needs and, and, and desires. The other program uh, that is absolutely terrific is the Tennessee uh, Lottery Programs. I mean, go up there on this website uh, run by the Tennessee Higher Education uh, Commission. There are actually 10 different programs there, and it's really wonderful uh, that this is an opportunity for you to um, leverage your savings and find other free money and take advantage of some of these really wonderful state programs. So again, in the context of, of our discussion, um, savings is important and finding other free money is a great way to try to leverage that. So that next slide um, is, is one of my favorite slides of all time. Uh, it says, saving a dollar today is better than borrowing one tomorrow. We actually trademark that. Saving a dollar today is better than borrowing one tomorrow. And the reason uh, why we like this so much is that for about every dollar that you borrow, you're going to actually have to pay back about $2 or $2.25 or somewhere in that range. So the idea of saving today and earning money and getting growth on the savings today means that you're leveraging that and actually creating a much better opportunity for students once they graduate from school. So they have less debt um, and they're not paying back two to one or a little more than two to one. The question always comes up, and I hear this every time I do a presentation. Well, you know, my my child's just been born and I have plenty of time. And I, again, as a dad, I kind of remember those days of changing diapers and all that, and you just think time is on your side. Um, and it is, um, as long as you take advantage of it wisely. And um, too often what happens, though, is particularly with something like saving for college, it's really easy to think that, well, I'll start tomorrow or I'll start next month or once the baby starts crawling or walking or and then you blink your eyes and they're on the soccer fields chasing the ball around. And then about two blinks of the eye later, they're in high school. And then you say, oh, is it too late for me to start saving? And the answer to that is, no, it's not too late to start saving because no matter what happens, uh, your student in high school is going to have anywhere from four to eight years or maybe a little longer than that before they actually graduate from college. So uh, whatever you can save today means you're most likely not going to have to borrow tomorrow. Um, so I think it's really important uh, sort of emotionally to come to grips with this. It's okay. If you haven't started yet, start today. 
Um, if you have started, that's really terrific and, and be disciplined about it. And before you know, um, you'll have a nice little nest egg for a college um, education. And then finally, uh, well, this almost finally, how to start means just opening an account and when to start um, today uh, for the reasons that I just talked about compounding, tax free growth, and some of the other attributes of 529 programs is most effective uh, the longer the period can be. So let's go uh, started to, well, before we get there, let, let, let's um, just look very briefly, and, and Lakeisha, you can click through right to the bottom. I just wanted to show um, what would happen if you starting uh, when a baby is born and you deposit $1,000 in there, and then you just contribute $100 a month um, at a 4% growth rate or interest rate. And you can see the value at age 18 um, is, is pretty significant if you start at the first birthday as opposed to starting at the 15th birthday. Um, having said that, I think a 15-year-old who goes off to college with $5,000 in their pocket is a lot better off than a 15-year-old who a couple years later or three years later um, has to go and, and look for a loan for $5,000. So again, the cost of delaying um, is really pretty significant. When time's on your side, try to take advantage of it. The next slide are, talks about different options to save. And why don't we go all the way through, and I'll, I'll just talk through each one of these, Lakeisha, because I th think we're on a, a good time path here. Um, there are, are many different ways and options to save for college. Um, one is just a regular bank account. Uh, might be at your local bank or credit union. Um, there are brokerage accounts, of course, uh, with some of the national players or, or some of the local players where you set up a a fund that's a little bit more sophisticated than just a passbook type savings account. Um, the one point about um, savings accounts and some brokerage accounts, particularly brokerage accounts that may have a high proportion of bonds in them, for instance, um, those accounts are less likely to keep up with the inflation rate. And we know that when it comes to saving for college, unfortunately, uh, college expenses have accelerated past the rate of inflation uh, sometimes in a multiple of annual inflation rates for, for many years now. Uh, the only good news in the last year or two is it seems that that trend is starting to slow down a little bit. But just make a note that in savings accounts and brokerage accounts, particularly when there are high portions of bonds in there or very safe investments, um, sometimes they don't keep track with inflation, which means you'll uh, not keep up with the, the college cost inflation as well. There are some U.S. savings bond programs that are also available um, these are much less popular these days because of some of the tax effects and also because of the popularity of two of them that we're going to talk about in a moment. Um, Roth IRAs pop up every now and again is a, is a nice way to save for college. Um, again, um, we happen to believe, and, and I'll say I personally, since this is not uh, an endorsement uh, by Tennessee Stars, the Academy, or the Treasurer's Office, this is my personal view, um, is that retirement uh, savings should be for retirement. and. Although the Roth IRAs may look attractive, there are reasons uh, that uh, it's less attractive than the next two options. And the next two options are 529 plans and the Coverdell Education Savings Accounts. On the next slide, we talk about uh, Coverdell. And when these uh, were first started, uh, probably 15 or so years ago, uh, they were extremely popular um, because they allowed the users, the investors, to actually use some of these savings for K to 12 expenses. And at that time, that was not permitted under the 529 programs. Um, so the Coverdell education savings accounts were set up almost as an alternative, if you will, to some of the attributes of the 529 accounts, but they did impose on these income restrictions, 110,000 for a single earner, 220 for a joint. There's also an annual contribution limit of only $2,000 and this account needs to be fully distributed by age 30. Um, so there were some limitations in place on that. The 529 accounts, on the other hand, uh, have been uh, popular and started since the 1990s, the mid 90s. And at that point, there were two different kinds of plans, one known as a prepaid plan. And at one point, Tennessee had a prepaid plan, but it's no longer available. Uh, there are also a second, I'll say flavor of these plans, and those are savings plans, the 529 savings plans. And for about the next uh, 15 or so minutes, we're going to focus on the attributes of the 529 plans. The next slide, please. 
So before we talk about the nuts and bolts, let me just put this in some context uh, for you. Uh, 529 plans uh, came about as a result of congressional action in the mid 1990s. The Congress looked around and said, you know, we've been pretty successful in getting folks to save for homes and we've been successful in starting retirement programs. We need to do something to encourage college savings. And so they, the, they came up with the 529 college savings plans uh, because the government is the government. They called it a 529 plan uh, rather than having marketing people uh, give them some advice of how you could uh, find a more descriptive title. But for them, 529 was um, section 529 of the Internal Revenue Code that had to be amended. So that's how we came about 529 plans. Uh, but since then, uh, these plans have grown in great popularity, and today there are almost 15 million accounts open, and we're we're over a little over 400 billion dollars, 400 billion dollars saved in these accounts. Um, so again, they've become quite popular, and the reason for that um, we'll talk now in the next uh, few minutes. First uh, important concept is that the Congress did not want to make these day trading accounts. Um, so they tried to find ways to limit that. And the way to limit that was to say that you can use the proceeds or the investments in the savings in these accounts only for qualified education expenses, QEEs as they're known in, in the industry. And the good news is, um, although they wanted to limit the withdrawals or what you could use the withdrawal for, they're pretty broad in how they think about it. So it's basically all college expenses that you can um, consider, you know, tuition, fees, room and board, a computer. Um, there are some things, as I found out, unfortunately, uh, my two sorority uh, girls, uh, the sorority dues are not uh, considered a qualified educational expense. Uh, so we had to pay that out of another pot of money, but uh, they're pretty liberal. Um, use of what the term qualified education expense is. Um, so that's a pretty key term. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, the second important term is the difference, uh, difference between a beneficiary and the account owner. An account owner is the person who sets up the 529 plan. Um, and what that means specifically is I, as a parent, I went on a website and I said, okay, my wife and I are going to own this account. Um, but we're going to make it for the benefit of our older daughter, Allison. So Allison had a 529 plan. Uh, when Emily came along, uh, we did a similar uh, search and, and opened the 529 plan for Emily. Um, the reason this important uh, differentiation should be noted is that as the account owner, I have a lot of flexibility with regard to what I do with that account. For instance, if Allison decided she didn't want to go to school or we're not going to be able to use that money for qualified education expenses, I could redesignate the beneficiary in that account. Um, so I could made it, uh, I could have redesignated it to a, a niece or a nephew, or I think on your website, you say to, to uh, the, the kid next door. Um, it was really meant to be very flexible again, to allow the account owner to, um, provide this educational opportunity for students that they wanted to, to uh, make the beneficiary. So that, that's a really important point. The other important point as the account owner and as a parent, it's not included in my estate for uh, purposes of, uh, of the estate planning. Um, so some folks use this as an estate planning tool as, as well. Um, so if there's any kind of issue uh, or uh, or uh, an issue with regard to like a, a bankruptcy or whatever that might be, that money is specially designated for the beneficiary and it's not part of any asset that a third party can, can come back and, and try to claim. Very recently, uh, within the last several years, the 529 um, QEE definition was expanded. So now um, you can use qualified education expenses um, to pay for K-12 um, costs still pay for college. I say certain apprenticeship programs here as well. Um, one of the reasons why we see certain is that uh, if your student is interested in an apprenticeship program, I would counsel you to go on the Department of Education. That's the U.S. Department of Education website, um, and you can look very clearly. It tells you precisely what programs are available. Uh, it's, meant, again, meant to be broad, but they're trying to um, make sure that students are getting a, a, a good 
a qualified program and not one of these fly by night programs that sometimes can pop up. Um, so they're trying to protect students and families there. And then finally, um, you can use up to $10,000 per beneficiary for student loans. Um, so let's say the your student goes through and you have $10,000 left in that account after they're done with college or they're not going to go to grad school, um, but they do have some student loans, you can pay down up to $10,000 worth of that principal um, for student loans. Um, so again, the idea is uh, a broad application, a great opportunity to save for college. Let's go to the next slide where we talk in a little bit more detail about the Tennessee STARS uh, 529 program uh, directly. Um, again, trying to, to be as, uh, as broad and as bold as possible. Uh, there's a minimal uh, contribution opening requirement of $25. Um, we say that this is a direct sold plan, and direct sold uh, means that the state really is responsible for running that. It gets best in class investments for five uh, Tennessee Stars 529 account holders to access. But because it's a direct sold plan, um, there are direct uh, benefits as well. And one of those benefits is that you don't need a financial advisor or a third party to ha help you open this account. Um, so you get the opportunity to go on. And you can select uh, either the age based program or 1 of the 15 self selected programs. And so, again, it's a, it's a benefit that way, because the fees then are basically as low as they can be. Um, when, when you come to a direct sold program like this, um, the fees can range basically from basically 20 to 84 cents per 100 dollars invested. So it's a, again, a low fee program. Um, designed to help families save as much as possible um, going through. Uh, you can enroll online. This is the website. Uh, really terrific, uh, easy to use website. Talks a lot about the tax advantages and also uh, gives a lot of information around um, what you can do to save for tuition and, and how to use these programs effectively. Um, we're also going to talk in a moment about the federal tax advantages that are, that are there. Uh, that really make these programs uh, one of the best in class um, savings programs uh, for that you can that you can access anywhere. Uh, the last thing I'll say that on that site um, also there's a nice savings calculator so you can go in and and do a little uh, what if scenarios. Uh, you know what if I save this amount? How much will I have in the next number of years? Uh, meant to be really intuitive and easy to use. So. Uh, TennesseeStars.com, a great site, lots of really terrific information there. Uh, and there's a, also a great section, I, I looked at it uh, just before we started, uh, the frequently asked questions uh, are really very, very well done. So um, I would highly recommend anyone interested in, in thinking more about how to um, save for college using a Tennessee Stars 529 program, go to TNStars.com and you'll get all the information you need. Uh, the next slide um, talks uh, specifically and, and more generally about the upside of 529 savings plans. And these um, include the fact that once the money goes in, there's no taxes during the investment period. Um, so previously, when we talked about brokerage accounts or even uh, savings accounts, of course, you're, you're paying tax on those earnings on an annual basis uh, for, for many of those investments. That one of the great advantages of the 529 savings plans is that you don't need to pay taxes at all during that period. So every dollar you put in from the from the first investment right to the end is sitting there and it's growing uh, without the requirement to have the, the federal government put their hand in your pocket. So you're getting basically maximum savings there uh, possible during that uh, growth period. The second important point is that there's no tax due as long as that money is used for a qualified educational expense. So in my case, uh, my daughters had their 529s, and uh, when it came time to, to write that first check, um, I literally just uh, sent a note to the 529 provider and said, you know, please withdraw X dollars from Allison's account and send it to her college, and that was taken care of. Uh, so it was really very simple to use. Um, and I knew um, as a result of the fact she was using it for a qualified educational expense, there would be no tax effect as a result of that. Uh, so no taxes during the growth period and no taxes upon withdrawal uh, from, from the account. 
Also, um, unlike the Coverdells, there's no income restriction on, on what you can put in. And uh, for many programs, there's a very high contribution limit. Um, so this is becomes a really way, uh, really uh, nice way to save for money over a longer uh, term. Also, as I mentioned earlier, um, there's a flexibility to switch beneficiaries. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, uh, the account owner may determine they, they want to uh, switch that beneficiary. And by the way, you can even um, make yourself the beneficiary. Uh, so if my daughter had money uh, left in her 529, I could have redesignated that money to myself and saved it there until a grandchild came along or until I determined that another beneficiary could use it. Or perhaps if Allison went back to graduate school, I could redesignate her as the beneficiary. But again, lots and lots of uh, flexibility with regard to um, who's eligible to use that money. The next point um, is what I was getting at a little bit earlier, kind of alluding to it, uh, that for tax planning purposes and estate planning purposes, um, 529 accounts can uh, be really uh, terrific vehicles for those of means uh, who want to accelerate some of their gifting. So as we know currently, um, we can provide a $15,000 gift uh, to, to anyone, and uh, as, a, as a couple, you can do 30000 of that. So you have a, an ability to accelerate five years' worth of gifting. Um, so seventy five, or in some cases $150,000 can go in day one um, and take advantage of that compound uh, and, and growth over a longer period of time. And finally, uh, the uh, account owner, as I said earlier, has p uh, protection from bankruptcy from those uh, from any actions that might occur down the line. Um, so, for lots of reasons, uh, the 529 plans have grown in popularity. Uh, again, mostly uh, for the tax uh, benefits that are that are uh, attributable to these accounts. We we'll always like to talk about the downside of of uh, investments as well. Um, this uh, is important to know that. If for whatever reason uh, an account holder determines that there's no further use for that 529 money, uh, there's nobody to redesignate to, uh, maybe the student's not going back to school, wh whatever it might be, and you just come to the end of the line, uh, what happens is the Congress provided for the fact that you would pay taxes and pay a penalty. It's a 10% penalty on the earnings of those uh, non qualified withdrawals. So, um, what that means sort of in English, a non-qualified QEE withdrawal means a withdrawal for something other than a qualified education expense. Uh, so it could be just about anything. Uh, the the uh, other point, as I said earlier, was that we only have two investment um, options uh, allowed to be changed per year. And the reason they did that, again, is they don't want this to become a day trading account. Um, so you're allowed to make those investment options uh, changes twice. Of course, in, in the Tennessee program, there's the age based where, which means that as a student uh, progresses from kindergarten to first grade, all the way through high school, um, as you get closer to high school, it, I'm sorry, as you get closer to college, what happens is the investments automatically recalibrate each year um, so that you have less risk of uh, equities, meaning higher returns, but also potential for higher loss. And it allows a calibration to lower risk investments so that when it comes time to make that withdrawal, um, you're able to have some, uh, the best, I'm gonna put it this way, the, the most efficient preservation of capital as you can have. Um, so those investment option changes become uh, pretty important. So here are uh, three facts or myths. Uh, this comes up quite a, quite a bit. Uh, one of the myths is I have to use the money for a college in my state. Uh, so the answer to that is that no, you, you don't. Um, you can use the Tennessee uh, STARS 529 account uh, savings to go to school in any state. In fact, you can go to, to some qualified overseas schools as well. Uh, so again, Congress wanted to make sure that it was very flexible and easy to use, and it's not required uh, to use 529 savings plans within uh, Tennessee. You can you can go outside the borders. I will make this one note for those of you who may have the prepaid program. Uh, those are for in-state schools, but you knew that when you, you bought that plan. But the savings plans can be used uh, across uh, any, any at any eligible institution is the, the best way to say that. On the second uh, question, uh, my daughter didn't go to college so I can make myself the beneficiary of her money. 
I kind of answered that earlier. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we emphasize this, that it could be any qualified member, including but not limited to siblings, stepchildren, aunts, uncles, spouses, first cousins. Again, it's very broad. Um, the third um, factor myth, savings in a 529 will reduce my son's financial aid. And this is a big one. I actually did a, a presentation for a high school uh, two evenings ago, and this came up. And the answer is, um, currently, the financial aid formula is uh, determined mostly based on income. So you can go and, and uh, file the federal, uh, the application for federal student aid, the FAFSA form. Um, and when that comes back, there's a determination in there of how much aid a student will be eligible for. And a good portion of that is based on income, but there is also a portion of it that is uh, based on either parent assets or the child's assets. Um, so it is true that in your financial aid eligibility could be reduced by as much as 5.64% for amounts that are in a 529 savings account. Um, so what that means is for every $10,000 of financial aid you may be eligible for, you could see a reduction of $564. I want to emphasize one thing. I said very carefully that you may be eligible for. Um, there are, uh, these are need-based calculations. So your family may not qualify for any financial aid, need-based financial aid to begin with. But if they are, if your student is, um, then that amount could be reduced by, again, in my example, $564. I do want to um, sort of, Compare that to uh, the uh, a case where a student might have in their own name their own savings, and let's say they have ten thousand dollars in savings. That same formula would say that that student would be expected to contribute two thousand dollars or twenty percent of that savings. Um, so again, this is one of those examples where the Congress kind of put their money where their mouth was about trying to help people save efficiently, and they're um, only providing for a small fraction of the savings account to be counted toward um, financial aid eligibility. On the next slide, I see we have um, probably about seven or eight minutes or so. If anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll try to answer them before we come offline. Uh, but I did want to talk a little bit about that crowdfunding uh, that we talked about earlier, online gifting programs. Um, sometimes so what folks will do is they'll take the cash back that they might have in their credit card per rebate programs and put it into a 529. Um, or uh, they may take advantage of a program like UGIFT, uh, which uh, Tennessee has. Again, I think of it as a you know, pretty cool 2021 version of aunts and uncles, and it takes a village to help a, a student get through. But the UGIFT uh, program, very easy to use. Again, if you go up on the Tennessee Star site, um, you'll be able to uh, find lots of really great information about how to um, use that program uh, very effectively. The um, the next the, there's the there's a slide now the next um, the next slide uh, just what makes the point that um, if you're able to um, provide a, a gift of twenty five dollars twice a year and you get five gift givers or 10 gift givers, how quickly uh, that money can accumulate um, over a period of, of uh, six or uh, of over a period of 18 years. So again, just a little visual um, to show that um, if you're fortunate enough to have a few people um, helping here, um, those uh, that little nest egg can grow pretty quickly. Finally, uh, resources that are available um, within the state. Uh, there's some great resources available. Uh, Tennessee Source Academy, of course, through these uh, webinars and, and other uh, programs that are run, uh, but also there are there's the Tennessee Promise program that we talked about earlier, and also uh, the Tennessee Higher Education Commission um, has a lot a lot of information uh, up on the website, so that that will be useful. Um, last, uh, feel free to go to mycollegecorner.com. Uh, MyCollegeCorner.com has um, free resources, the college search I mentioned earlier, the scholarship search, the financial aid calculator. But there are also some webinars up there, and we post um, blog articles or, um, frankly, if, uh, Lakeisha, if you like, I'd be glad to post this up uh, as well. Uh, just trying to get information out uh, on, a, on, a, on a free basis that will help parents demystify this whole process of planning and paying for college. And, 
and, and very importantly, sort of reduce that uh, emotion that I talked about earlier so that you can start to look at the college decision and how to pay for it, just like you might uh, think about any other consumer purchase that you're going to make. I think that families who are who have students in high school and are starting to look at colleges should think of themselves as consumers of education and make that purchase decision much like they would purchase a car or any other um, really important high cost asset. So I want to just thank everyone again. I know we have uh, four or so minutes. I saw one uh, one question come up about the difference between a 529 and an UGMA or an UTMA account. Um, in in uh, Plan and Finance Your Family's College Dreams, we talk about this, uh, but basically an UGMA and UTMA is a terrific way to segregate money for a child. Uh, the primary difference is that child owns that asset. Uh, so when they became 18 or 21 or whatever the age is uh, that, that's planned, that becomes their money. They can use it for whatever they want. Uh, there are other important differences. There are some tax implications as well that we don't have time really to go into right now. Lakeisha, any other questions? No, I actually don't see um, any other questions within the chat. And John, I cannot thank you enough for your excellent presentation today for the information. And I hope that everyone who has joined us um, has learned something. And as we mentioned before, the webinar has been recorded and we'll have it available uh, for you to go back and reference. And John, you know, we take you up on your offer to have it posted not only uh, on our website, but, you know, on, on your college corner or any other resources it's going to be so that it can reach a broader uh, audience. So I uh, sincerely appreciate everything you've shared today uh, and your time and the time of everyone who uh, was able to join us during the lunch period today. So, yeah, wonderful. Lakeisha, thank you. And I'm just going to make one last closing comment, and that is um, this is a this can be a quite a process, but at the end of the day, um, you're going to have a big smile on your face when you see your daughter or your son or your granddaughter or whomever it might be walk across the stage and know that you know you help contribute to their success and and another bright college graduates uh, in the world. So uh, thank you. Uh, be hopeful. Take a deep breath and, and enjoy this experience of having children in this process. It's it's truly a blessing. Thank you all. Thank you, John. And everyone, we have we will have our next T Tennessee Stars Academy session in September of this year. So look forward to information. You'll see it in our third quarter newsletter that will go out in August. And so look forward to those details and the opportunity to register. So have a wonderful day and uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Bye-bye.